All right, comrades. Well, what the Bolsheviks achieved in 1917 has no parallel in history up to the present day. A country of 160 million people. When the revolution broke out, the Bolsheviks had 8,000 members. That's one Bolshevik for every 20,000 inhabitants in the country. That would be like a revolution breaking out here in Italy, country of 69 million, and starting with a party of like 3,500 people. And within the space of the next eight months, the party grew 30-fold, and it won the support of millions. It overthrew the provisional government. It brought the Soviets to power. And it built the first workers' government in history that was able to hold on to power. They particularly won the working class, which was a minority of the Russian population. If you take just the industrial factory workers of Russia, by October, nearly one out of 15 of them was a member of the Bolshevik party. Now, we don't have time to have a detailed review of uh, 1917 itself. But my goal is to discuss what it took to prepare the Bolsheviks for October. What was it that made those 8,000 Bolsheviks capable of performing what appeared to be a miracle? Because if we ask ourselves, what does it mean to build a Bolshevik party? At what point do we get to look back at our work and say, good work, comrades, we did it. We have a Bolshevik party now. That day will only come when we're prepared to carry out the same achievement that the Bolsheviks did. In the last uh, decade, there was a, a wave of uh, a different type of socialism that became popular around the world. I'm talking about the 2010s. And in the US, it was the, the Sanders craze and, and Corbyn in Britain. And that, that trend had a mouthpiece. It had a, a publication that came along with it, Jacobin Magazine. And they published an article for the centenary of the October Revolution in 2017. It's called The New Communists. And it has some advice for us. It says, stop worrying about the old answers to old questions. Today, the probability of a socialist revolution is infinitesimally small. <clears throat> the world's working class has moved on. And yet the far left today embraces the Soviet obsession like a vampire hunter wields garlic. They say the left is held back by its inability to move on from these dreams of apocalyptic rupture. Well, that's the voice of a petty bourgeois variety of socialism that is currently withering into dust. The young generation has not moved on from dreams of revolution. Instead, they moved on from Jacobin Magazine. They moved on from a brand of democratic socialism that would sneer at October. History has moved on from them. Does anyone remember what was happening in the United States four years ago this week? Uh, I think Donald Trump remembers. Because he was hiding in a bunker under the White House. And there were 26 million people in the streets. And Trump ordered the US Army to prepare to deploy across US cities within the space of five hours. And dozens of generals at the Pentagon were warning him that he risked playing his last card if he did that. And 54% of the population thought it was justified when protesters in Minneapolis burnt down the police precinct. And in a growing number of neighborhoods, regular working class people were taking up arms and setting up patrols to defend their neighborhoods against the police and against right-wing thugs. So it's not such an old question, is it? I'm very interested in how the Bolsheviks pulled off their miracle. <laughs> because there's nothing more important in my life than participating in the replication of that achievement in the United States in my lifetime just like thousands of us are trying to achieve around the world. At the second Congress of the Communist International in uh, 1920, 
delegates from around the world showed up in, in Moscow, an international gathering, something like, like this international gathering. And in their rooms, the delegates found uh, some Congress documents that they had to read to prepare for the proceedings. One of them was a booklet that uh, Lenin had written for the delegates. And it was intended to teach them how the Bolsheviks achieved victory so that they could apply the lessons in their own countries. It was called left-wing communism, an infantile disorder. And I love that the beginning of the book just dives right in, so concise, so clear. He starts an, a, a, uh, an indispensable condition for the success of the Bolsheviks. He said, we could not have retained power for two and a half months, let alone two and a half years, without the most rigorous and truly iron discipline in our party. He says, overthrowing the bourgeoisie is impossible without a long, stubborn, desperate life and death struggle. It calls for tenacity, for self-sacrifice, for a single inflexible will. Lenin explains that as a current of political thought and as a political party, Bolshevism began since in 1903. And he said, only the history of Bolshevism during its entire existence can explain where that discipline came from. He gives a few, uh, a few of the main points to explain where that discipline came from. First, it comes from the, the prole something inside the proletarian vanguard. There has to be a generation with something with a sense of self-sacrifice and devotion. That comes from class consciousness, from recognizing your position in society. It also comes from history, from, his, from living in a society that makes people say, I want nothing more than to bring this system down. <clears throat> Lenin says, secondly, those people have to be merged with the working class. They have to sink roots. It's like a, a plant needs to be anchored in the soil. And it's, it's moving, those roots are collecting nutrients from the soil and the party is sending ideas into the working class, but it's also receiving insights from the working class. Lenin said the third condition is the party has to have correct ideas. It needs to have the right tactics, the right strategy, it needs to understand where reality is heading. And the working class has to be able to verify through their own experience that the party's position is correct. Lenin explains that Bolshevism arose on the granite foundation of Marxist theory. And really, the party was a vehicle for transmitting those ideas. Uh, it was training leaders who could use Marxism to actually think, to apply it to reality. And finally, Lenin points out in this chapter that there was 15 years of really intense experience that the party went through leading up to 1917. It was unequaled anywhere in the world in such a short space of time to go through so many forms of the movement. Legal and illegal, peaceful and stormy, underground and open, local circles, mass movements, parliamentary forms and battles on the barricades. All of that was necessary to train the cadres of Bolshevism. <laughs> they needed ideological training, they needed a disciplined structure, they needed to have fierce internal debates and be connected to the international debates of the Marxist movement. They had to go through multiple revolutions, multiple wars, multiple periods of reaction. The benefit is that all of that happened in a pretty, concise, a pretty short space of time and it produced these cadres. When we define Bolshevism, we often refer to like psychological traits, like having an iron will, the determination to smash all obstacles. I think these are part of the definition. I think it's, it, is, it contains part of the picture. Because you can imagine what it would mean if you think to, to, to lead a modern day uprising of the working class. You better have something special. You need a strong psychology. You need an ideological backbone. But this is one of the, the best definitions that I've seen of, uh, of Bolshevism was published by the Communist International in 1925. Bolshevism is not merely a doctrine, but a system of revolutionary training for the proletarian uprising. And what does the revolutionary training of the cadres consist of? It is giving them such a training and effecting such a selection of the leading staff 
as would prevent them from drifting when the hour for their October strikes. I think that's an excellent definition of Bolshevism. That was written by the architect of the October insurrection himself, Leon Trotsky. You know, the Bolshevik party was a party of cadres. It was a cadre organization. When you have a, a small, well-organized body that has a lot of expertise, and it's capable of expanding rapidly into a massive force and taking in a big influx of new people <laughs> and transmit organization and expertise to that big expanded body, that's the general function of a cadre organization in, in the abstract. I have a, a dictionary definition here of a cadre. A group of trained or otherwise qualified personnel capable of forming, training, or leading an expanded organization. Now think about it in a, in a wartime context. This is used often in, the, in a military sense. Militaries will define a cadre as a key group of officers and enlisted personnel necessary to establish and train a new military unit. Think about the process of raising an army for a wartime mobilization. You have a, a draft, a wartime conscription, and broad layers of the population are being drafted into the army. And new soldiers, they're enlisted, they're put through a rapid basic training. And the goal is to make them battle ready in the shortest possible space of time. And then they're, giving, they're, they're given a weapon, they're assigned to a unit, they're given their marching orders on the battlefield. Well, in 1917, those 8,000 Bolsheviks were the general staff of October. And they raised a mass revolutionary party in much the same way. Remember, starting from 8,000, they grew 30-fold. That's a quarter of a million. And that's, that averages out to, if you were to take that, that increase uh, and average it out over those eight months, that's 1,000 people joining you every day for eight months. But instead of arming them with a gun and deploying them on the battlefield, they armed them with a program. And they were assigned to go back to their workplace and explain the program to their coworkers and win them over to it. Of course, the, 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 the general staff that raises an army has to be very well trained. The bourgeois states have their military academies, and they don't just train their staff to just give commands. They train them in the theory of war. They study history. They study society. They even study psychology. They need to have the ability to think under immense pressure. Well, again, the, his the entire history of the Bolshevik party created those kinds of people. I want to run through some of this history, uh, beginning with the, the early beginnings. The forerunners of the Bolshevik, there was a, a pre-Marxist revolutionary movement called the Narodniks. Their slogan was, go to the people. And they thought the peasantry was going to be the force to carry out a revolution. And most of these were middle-class students and intellectuals. And they gave up their normal lives and comforts to try and spark a peasant uprising to bring down the Tsar. This started in the 1860s. It kind of reached a high point in the 1870s. It, it reached a crisis in the 1880s. And the, the tactics varied, but the movement became a terrorist movement. These were young kids building bombs and trying to assassinate czarist officials. And they actually killed one of the czars, uh, Alexander II, in 1881. Lenin's own brother was a Narodnik. And he was uh, arrested for his attempt to assassinate Alexander III, the, the, czar, the next czar. He was in prison for several months. And then one day the, uh, the jailer comes and says, you have two hours left, we're going to hang you. And his words, his final words were the words of revolutionary. He said, I had but one aim, to help the unfortunate Russian people. There is no finer death. Such a death holds no terror for sincere and honest men. Well, that honest man had just turned 21 years old. His people were willing to sacrifice their lives for the cause. As far as tenacity and self-sacrifice goes, these people were heroes. And that spirit of Narodnism was inherited by the Bolsheviks. They had the tenacity, but they didn't have the roots in the working class, and they didn't have the correct ideas. By the 1880s, the movement was at an impasse because all the leaders were imprisoned. And they had made no headway winning the peasantry. And in the year 1880, one of these Narodniks had to flee abroad. And he discovers the ideas of Marxism. 
It was life-changing. It blew his mind. The answers to all of the questions that he had. This is a quote from that man. Anyone who did not live through those times can hardly imagine the eagerness with which we threw ourselves into the study of Marxist literature. The more we read, the more we realized the weak points of our earlier views. The theories of Marx, were, they guided us out of this labyrinth that we were stuck in. That was Georgi Plekhanov, the father of Russian Marxism. In 1883, he founded the first Marxist organization in Russia, the Emancipation of Labor Group. And it's pretty amazing if you think that's a, con a huge country, 140 million probably at the time. And there's no Marxist there. Pretty, pretty much no one's heard of Marxism. It has no influence. This group of five people has no resources or visibility. And they're trying to bring a new ideology into that kind of scenario. That was 1883. Now think of the timeline. By the end of the 1890s, by the end of the following decade, here's how Lenin described the political landscape. Marxist books were published one after another. Marxist journals and newspapers were founded. Nearly everyone became a Marxist. Anyway, the, the point is the entire revolutionary movement abandoned Narodnism and shifted over to Marxism. It was a very dramatic shift. And this was a really, this was a, the, the, the revolutionary generation felt illuminated by materialism, by dialectics, by historical, by ma historical materialism. It, the effect was that there was a mushrooming, a, a spontaneous popping up of Marxist discussion groups all over Russia. It started with intelligentsia and students, and these were really dense writings. They were studying theory and philosophy. They were studying the roots of Marxism. But in the 1890s, the working class was growing rapidly. There was a rapid industrialization. And suddenly the class struggle became something very concrete. It correspond the theory and reality corresponded perfectly. So the movement made efforts to bring these ideas to the working class. They were forming circles of factory workers who were studying Marxist theory. Uh, meanwhile, the entire apparatus of czarism that had been hunting the Narodniks for decades is now targeting the Marxists and arresting them and confiscating their literature. This was the state of the movement when Lenin began, began his political activity. He, uh, he became active in 1893 in St. Petersburg. Uh, within two years, he was arrested, like so many other revolutionaries. He wasn't released for five more years. He spent five years in czarist prisons and exile, thinking, reading, studying, but also analyzing the movement. He was obsessively developing a plan. The, uh, the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party was actually founded while he was in exile. And I should explain that the social democracy at the time was the way that the international Marxist movement referred to itself. The Second International had been founded in 1889, less than a decade before this party had been founded. Anyway, Lenin was in Siberia drafting Congress documents that were smuggled to this Congress. There was just nine delegates. Almost all of them were immediately arrested after the Congress, and that was it. Lenin saw that this, I mean, the party was beginning. It was taking steps forward, but there was so much that still remained to, to be done. Lenin was released in 1900, and he he immediately got to work transforming those scattered, disorganized forces into a professional, effective, revolutionary party. He wrote, what is to be done? And this was a really sharp polemic. Just like Plekhanov, Lenin learned, uh, he took a lot from Plekhanov, but he learned this really incredible po polemical style. And when you read it, it can sometimes seem like a vicious beatdown. But there wasn't anything mean-spirited about him. He, was, he had one concern. Clarity. How do you get the cadres to see the mistake, the inconsistency of, of the opponent? Well, this is what he does in, in what is to be done. He's polemicizing against different publications, against a trend called the economists. That can be summed up by saying, the economic struggle is for the workers. Leave the political struggle to the liberals. He had this uh, condescending middle-class view that the workers were incapable of grappling with theory. And really, it was opening the door to a, a soft version of Marxism, a reformist uh, version of Marxism. <laughs> the essence of the argument in what is to be done is that the, the movement has been going through phases. Lenin's analyzing the, the development of the movement. 
He said, we've made huge strides. We have all of these circles springing up everywhere. But it has serious shortcomings. It's amateurish, it's uncoordinated, it's disorganized, it's chaotic. And the worst part is this is supposed to be a Marxist movement and its leaders are vacillating on their Marxism. Well, what is to be done was like a battle plan for addressing the situation. Bringing order and professionalism to the scattered circles and putting Marxism at the center of it, using the ideas of Marxism to build a disciplined core. Launching the paper Iskra in 1900 was a practical major step in this direction. It wasn't just a paper, it was a network of agents that brought consciousness to all of the circles that they were part of one big uh, phenomenon. Uh, the movement started to recognize itself, it started to talk to each other, they were reading each other's reports. And this was, a, again, a, a period of establishing order. Um, you know, you had committees, one committee in every city. Below the committee you had district committees. Those district committees coordinated factory committees. The factory committees had subcommittees. And there was a whole web of technical committees. Uh, this is where the word committee man comes from, from this period. But you needed a detailed division of labor uh, in order to conduct clandestine work. This was the situation at the time of the Second Congress in 1903. And without, without getting into details of, of the, the debate that took place there, it was a struggle over what kind of party are we going to have? Will it be a professional cadre organization or a broad, loose organization? It seemed to be a clash over organizational questions, but it had a deeper significance. Lenin said later, those differences really only came out in 1905. And that year was like a trial by fire for all the parties. Bloody Sunday, January 9th, 140,000 march to petition the Tsar peacefully. <clears throat> over 4,000 are shot in cold blood by the Tsarist officials. Hundreds of them die. Just like that, a revolution begins. The workers are picking up the bodies and carrying them on carts through the city, marching, saying, give us arms. Three million workers go on a political strike, and then it escalates into an es insurrection. The si the, in this situation, the party needed a totally different form. That cadre skeleton needed to take in the influx. It needed to do what it's supposed to do and expand. And the party committees resisted. You see how that period of discipline, of trying to tighten things up, that created habits that then became an obstacle when the situation changed. Lenin said that every month of 1905 was like a year's worth of education during normal periods. You had the rise of the Soviets out of strike committees. Uh, they represented hundreds of thousands of workers across hundreds of factories. They coordinated strikes, but through the, through the strike action, they were actually playing the role of a governing force. They achieved freedom of press. They had a, a shorter working day. They took over the railways, the telegraphs, the postal service. They set up regular street patrols. They were acting like a government. Well, there was different conceptions of what the Soviets represented. The Mensheviks supported the Soviets and they even helped set them up. But they thought the Soviets should be like a, a non-political labor congress. Or they thought it could become like a reformist labor party, like a European uh, workers' party. This was the, the position of the Mensheviks. And really, the Mensheviks had kind of grown out of economism. They wanted to adapt the workers' movement to the interests of the liberal capitalist class. This is because their view of Marxism was a, was a rigid view. They thought that Tsarism represented, because it was a, f a remnant of feudalism, then Tsarism should be overthrown and replaced by capitalism. And therefore the task of the revolutionary movement should be to support the liberals against the Tsar. Okay, the, the position of, of Lenin in relation to the tasks of the revolution, he didn't have any illusions in the, the capitalist class. He thought Tsarism should be replaced by a coalition between the workers and the peasantry. He called it a democratic dictatorship of the peasantry and the proletariat. And basically this would, this would exclude the, the bourgeoisie and it would uh, achieve democratic rights for the workers. And he said a revolution that achieved that would then spark, it would have a huge impact in Europe. And once the workers of Europe move, then they could advance to a socialist revolution. But when the Soviets emerged, uh, you know, Lenin's position evolved a little bit. He saw the Soviets and he said, this could be the embryo of a workers' government. That was exactly Trotsky's position, by the way. And I should explain that in 1903, when they, you had that, that uh, really uh, intense factional fight between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, when it appeared to be over organizational issues, like an unjustified reason to split the party, at that specific juncture, Trotsky sided against Lenin with the Mensheviks. 
As soon as those, those divisions started to exhibit political content, Trotsky became independent of both factions. And he had the perspective that this should be, it should be possible to bring everyone together, to win everyone to a correct position and have a large unified party. He probably looked at Lenin and said, That's, you're, you have a hard line view, it's, you're not allowing the party to come together. Well, I believe Trotsky looked back at that position and said that was the greatest mistake of his life. And I don't, maybe it was those five years in uh, exile and prison that allowed Lenin to see this thing very clearly, because he saw it more clearly than anybody else. But L Lenin wanted ideological homogeneity, a party of people that think the same way, that are rowing in the same direction, people who are completely devoted who are not uh, competing, the party's not competing for uh, their time and attention with other interests. <laughs> now the truth is, the Mensheviks wanted the party to be open to like fellow travelers and like intellectuals and sympathetic people. <laughs> so those were the two trends within Russian social democracy. They ended up really diverging later. But I mention this because at every juncture, the, the, the political position of Lenin and Trotsky was almost exactly the same. At an early stage, Lenin had seen this. He had tried to get Trotsky to join the Iskra editorial board. Anyway, once the split happened, they were, you know, Trotsky was not a Bolshevik for many years. Anyway, that's an aside. Going back to 1905. Lenin and Trotsky both see the Soviets as the embryo of a workers' government. But the Bolshevik committee men, they saw the Soviets as competition for, against the party. They were suspicious of them. The vast majority of Bolsheviks, they were like, we should boycott the Soviet, or we should present an ultimatum that the Soviet should be under the discipline of the party. or else we should try to dissolve the Soviet. One Bolshevik in the, the conference in 1905 said, I think we should try to get into the Soviet and then explode it from within. Because think, they had been trained, we need a strict party, we need a strict line. We don't want all this variety. We don't want a non-Bolshevik uh, non party to emerge and confuse the workers. At this stage, Lenin was in a battle against his own cadres on this score as well. But he had the ability to size up a situation and understand to perceive the broader significance of events. Not just to see the immediate reality in front of him, but to anticipate the direction of events. Lenin was always uh, concerned with preparing the party for what was about to happen. to position the party so that it could benefit from the future situation. What activity can the party do today so that it can connect with the workers tomorrow? This is dialectics, by the way. <clears throat> well, on the back of 1905, eventually the party did open up to an influx. And actually, under the impact of the events, the, the ranks of the Bolshevik and Menshevik committees, they just started merging spontaneously. Their attitude was, yeah, we've had our differences in the past, but this is the revolution. The slogan of 1905 was, down with the autocracy. They could all agree on that. They were, they were all advocating a general strike. They wanted to move the insurrection forward. Now, what would have happened if the insurrection had succeeded in 1905? That's another question. They would not have been in agreement in that, in that case. But at this stage, there was organic uh, pressure for unity, and the party did, th those factions actually did unite. How many total minutes do I have? Okay. Um, so actually, they, they had a, a formal unity at the Stockholm Unity Congress in 1906, and they basically brought Bolshevism and Menshevism back into one happy family. <laughs>
Now keep in mind, up until the breakout of 1905, we're, the, the party was not big. This is maybe a couple thousand, maybe the Bolsheviks numbered just in the hundreds. And on the back of 1905, the party became a mass force for the first time in its history. It grew to a mass party of 150,000. And Lenin says the hundreds of revolutionary social democrats suddenly grew into thousands. And the thousands became the leaders of between two and three million proletarians. So you can see already at this stage, that cadre function had played a, a massive role. Now, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of, it really was not a happy family. I mean, they had a lot of serious divisions. In fact, sometimes you wonder, like, why did the Bolshe like, why did this marriage stay together so long, the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks? Yeah. <laughs> it was because it was nine years before they actually separated. Uh, but I think it had to do with the fact that the Social democracy was a pretty young movement internationally. And, you know, Marxism was having its first time as a mass phenomenon. So for the longest time, it was unthinkable to have, you know, to have the social democrats splitting. Why would you, po how could you possibly split the party? And what wasn't clear at the time was that there was two souls within social democracy, even internationally. And the most advanced Marxists, they recognized this, and they were, they were detecting it at an earlier stage and trying to push against it and fight against it. You know, it had to do with the fact that capitalism at that stage, it was at a younger phase of the system. It had 40 years of an upswing up until, uh, you know, World War I. And I think Marx died in 83, Engels died in 95, I think, 1895. And the German SPD was a huge uh, authority in the world. That was a genuine mass party. had influence over millions, for sure. But during that long period, a process had taken place, and they had started to adapt to a comfortable, peaceful period of capitalism. The point is, this, this, uh, this, this conflict of these two trends that were coexisting in Russian social democracy, it's a symptom of something that was happening internationally. <laughs> and the split that eventually happened, uh, was, uh, it, it foreshadowed the split that happened internationally between the second international and then the third. Anyway, I want to go back to, to 1905, after the defeat of that revolution. That was another phase of the movement. You see, a cadre organization, you can go from a small core into a, a massive uh, expansion. That's not necessarily just a one-way uh, development. It can also you can also lose that big influx and be reduced once again to the core. Lenin said, the parties, we were learning to attack, now we had to learn to retreat. When everything's moving forward and everyone's, the energy is rising and the ranks are swelling, it's, it's all going in one direction. It can be quite easy to, you just, if you feel like you're just growing as a force of nature, just like because of momentum. And what Lenin understood is that this is going to recede now. The, this revolution, it was defeated. And now the question is, who can keep their forces intact? How do you preserve that core? That's the only guarantee of the future. That's the only way that you're... It's like, you have to prepare for a period of reaction. You have one hope for getting through the other end in one piece. And that's the education of the cadres. And so that's, that was always Lenin's concern, especially when the 1905 revolution started to recede. But, you know, the, the whole history of the party, yes, they started learning Marxism with books. That's how they started. The real education was events and then the interaction between the theory and the events. You know, you can learn about dialectics, like everything is always changing. Everything contains something different within itself. 
And every situation is always in the process of bringing that other thing out. <laughs> it's another thing to keep your bearings when your, these events are actually unfolding and the situation is being transformed dramatically. But that's the thing that Lenin was a master at. Anyway, one of the central points of contention, one of these debates that really educated the ranks was uh, about the Duma. Now, this is a, a new situation. Tsarism, a repressive regime, there's no democratic outlet, there's no, there's no parliament, obviously. And, uh, of course, in 1905, the Soviets are emerging and the Tsarist regime is panicking. In August 1905, when the revolution was approaching its height, it was at full swing, the regime makes a desperate attempt to channel it back into something safe. And in an initiative under the minister Buligan, they appeal to the workers, we have something for you. We're going to set up a consultative body. And it's not going to actually be able to make laws, but we're going to hear your voice. You can elect some delegates to it. It's kind of like a Soviet. Well, the workers didn't, I mean, this, this, the workers ignored it. They rejected it. It was swept away almost immediately by the revolution itself. And all the social democrats at this point had the same attitude toward it. This, we boycott that thing. Show the workers that they have the power to dissolve this Tsarist institution. Don't go into an institution of the Tsar. You have the Soviets. Rely on your own strengths. Now, that was a position in 1905. 1906, totally different situation. There was a, a focal point, an insurrection attempted in December of 1905 in Moscow. Basically, an advanced section of the workers is moving to, to try in, in an armed uprising. But it's already kind of gone over the, the peak. They're appealing to the soldiers to, to mutiny, and the mutiny fails. This is when the Tsarist regime passes on to the offensive. They spot that opportunity. You have this minister Stalipin uh, step in, the hangman of the revolution. And he starts, I mean, hundreds, thousands are arrested, hundreds are executed. And now the revolution's going downhill. But the, Tsar, the Tsarist ministers decided, let's set up another Duma. Let's see if the workers are interested now. This was in uh, 1906. And the majority of the Bolsheviks rejected. No, another sham Duma? Of course, no. We'll boycott it again. And to their surprise, this time Lenin saying, wait, wait a minute. No, we should participate in this Duma. The situation's changing. This is one of our only legal opportunities to put our ideas into, into the public. Anyway, Lenin lost that vote and the Bolsheviks boycott the Duma. The main liberal bourgeois party, the cadets, that's short for constitutional democrats, they flood the Duma. And so in this public platform that the workers are watching, there's no Marxist voice to be heard. <clears throat> now, Lenin said that's, that, that was a mistake. He said it was a minor mistake, though. It wasn't, you know, a super serious one. You know, the Tsar was irritated at all this criticism he was getting from the, the liberals, and he decides to dissolve the Duma within 42 days anyway. <clears throat> In the meantime, the party is going through this intense internal battle. Do we, do we present candidates? Do we not? Do we boycott it? Because four months later, you see, the Tsar realized they needed certain institutions. They, they, they were caught unaware in 1905. They had no way to channel the movement. If you can set up something and then you can control it, it's a safety valve. <clears throat> so, a few months later, at, in November 1907, they do another Duma. And this time, more Bolsheviks are willing to, to support it. <clears throat> and the Mensheviks are very willing. They're, they're, they're starting to look at this like, okay, maybe we could get some reforms passed here. 
We can pressure the czar. You know the socialists that talk about pressuring the czar? <laughs> well, the czar, the czar wasn't impressed. He wasn't pressured. And uh, he decides to dissolve that Duma as well. And for good measure, all 54 social democratic delegates to that Duma were all arrested and sent to exile. <laughs> Get them out of the way. So that was called the Red Duma because the Social Democrats had participated. Uh, under Stolipin's initiative, they set up the, another Duma. And it's kind of like the czar is like uh, using successive approximations to get the balance just right. They want the right kind of Duma, you know? So. They tried the red Duma, now they have the black Duma. This is Stalipin's Duma. And they made sure the pro czarist monarchists dominated this Duma. And its, its powers were even more limited than all the others. And the Tsar was pretty happy with this one. It lasted for five years, actually. <laughs> All right, now the Bolsheviks, think about the Bolshevik uh, debate about do we participate or not. Now they're looking at this black Duma. By now, by now they really don't want to participate in this Duma. And Lenin has the opposite view. He really, really wants them to. He fought a vicious, exhausting battle for years to convince them that they had to participate. And behind that immediate conflict, you could see Lenin understood what was, how to prepare for the future. You know, this was a long period of reaction. It was a very brutal, demoralizing reaction. And for the workers, that was the only public uh, evidence of any opposition to the czar. Lenin was saying we have to, it would be criminal if we did not utilize every single opportunity, every foothold that the party has. In the meantime, you have to understand the party is collapsing. I mean, from the perspective of a lot of the ranks, a lot of the, the core ranks, that was it. Like that was the opportunity of a lifetime and now it's over. And the big influx, that, you know, all of those people that had recently joined the party, they just, whoom, they're gone, they're out. This, this period of reaction really started in 1908 and it lasted until like 1911. At one point, Lenin's in touch with like just a couple dozen people in all of Russia. That's like, that's his forces. But the Mensheviks are even in a worse position. I mean, they practically liquidated so Lenin's desperately just trying to reinforce the, the, the cadres, you know. Um, one of the expressions of this period of reaction and demoralization was uh, ideological wavering. Guess what? Suddenly people start to have doubts about materialism. They start to look inward like, I don't know, maybe Marxism let us down here. And they, they really, they look in, you know, it becomes a very like introspective period. People lose perspective. Lenin was on a mission to provide perspective, to fight against that, to defend materialism. Uh, eventually, the Bolsheviks did come out the other end. There was light at the end of the tunnel. In, in 1912, there was an atrocity. The Tsarist regime uh, massacred some workers that were striking at the Lina gold mine. <coughs> And it's like it brought something back to life in the working class. It brought their anger back. It brought, you know, it made them want to fight again. At this point, after years of these, these, these uh, horribly frustrating debates that were happening, I mean, if you understand the, the amount of factions that were in, in Lenin's own group uh, for all this period of reaction, it's not just that the Bolsheviks wanted to boycott the Duma. It's like you had five different trends that wanted to boycott the Duma in different ways. And the Mensheviks wanted to melt themselves into the Duma and liquidate the party and just be a legal faction in, the, in parliament. And 
within each of the factions, there was also a lot of conciliators that wanted to strike a deal with another faction. And Lenin's constantly trying to reinforce people and have something solid and find allies. Well, that's, that was what the experience of that depressing period of reaction was like. I mean, it's not fun. <laughs> In 1912, after that Lena massacre, when the working class starts to, show, to, to look up and raise its head again, uh, it's like a breath of fresh air. Finally, now, now we can get to work. Like, they came out of that period. <clears throat> and this was the time when Lenin was like, enough. Enough, enough of the Mensheviks. We're forming, we're going to break. We're going to break with them. And they actually have a Congress of all the, the Bolshevik uh, committees in the name of the RSDLP, in the name of the whole party. And they declare, we're the party now. It's the Bolsheviks. But what's, what's amazing is how the party just takes off after that. It's like they had liberated themselves from the dead weight of, the, of this group of people that didn't get it. <clears throat> they have their delegates in the Duma and it's, they're doing it the Bolshevik way now they use dozens and dozens of opportunities to actually make revolutionary agitation to expose the Tsarist regime within a couple of years four fifths of the active of the politically active working class four fifths of them are supporting the Bolsheviks In fact, the Bolsheviks now independently become a mass party again. And the strike wave is on the rise again. Now, if you're thinking, this is the phase where they prepared for October. They're, they became a mass force, the Bolsheviks were clear. No, the whole thing collapsed again. So World War I broke out and there was a wave of patriotism and the socialist movement was crushed. That must have been a bit disappointing to say the least <laughs> after that. <laughs> but the Bolshevik delegates, they were in the Duma when World War I broke out and they behaved heroically. They were put under immense pressure. And instead of uh, buckling to that pressure, they denounced the war. They refuse to vote for the war credits. They make revolutionary speeches. They're all arrested. They're all put on trial. They use the trials to do revolutionary agitation against the war. And all of them are given life sentences in Siberia. But eventually that paid off. Because the, the initial enthusiasm for the war didn't take long to wear off and turn into misery. And the workers remembered those speeches. They remembered the position of the Bolsheviks. Lenin later said, when 1917 broke out, the revolution, one of the reasons that the Bolsheviks were able to grow dramatically, grow 30-fold, was precisely because they had been perceived by the workers as the most hardline opponents of the regime within the reactionary Duma. They had participated in all uh, legal opportunities. They had sunk roots in the working class. And when 1917 broke out, it became clear suddenly why all of those years of intense debates were so crucial. And there was one final battle to be had. <clears throat> At the start of 1917, when the workers rose up and the Soviets emerged again, and this time, it's the Soviets emerge and they sweep aside the Tsarist regime. This was the, this was the real opportunity of a lifetime. This was the moment that the Bolsheviks had prepared their whole lives for. Most of the leading cadres at this time, they had joined the movement like in 1903. They'd mostly joined in their 20s. Some of them younger. And they'd spent decades talking about the coming revolution, talking about this perspective in the abstract. And at this moment, when they were faced with that reality, the Tsar had been overthrown. The armed workers are in the streets. The Soviets, in practice, were the ruling force. 
most of the comrades didn't understand that this was the moment to bring the working class to power. As soon as Lenin arrived in, uh, in Russia in April, <coughs> he spent three weeks uh, trying to wake up the party and shake them, straining every nerve to, to convince them politically that this is the moment. And the, the debates in the party at that time are so fascinating because it's like you see the conflict between theory and reality just clarifying itself in the moment. <coughs> And the Bolshevik cadres are they're using arguments that had come from the history of the party. They're saying, what about our, what about our program about the democratic dictatorship of the peasantry and the proletariat? <clears throat> and Lenin says, theory is gray, the, the, the tree of life is green, this is it. He said, things played out differently than we could have ever expected, but now that the Soviets have created a power, they shouldn't have handed it back to the bourgeoisie. And that is the, the, that's the new power that should, come, that should become the, the, the state. All power to the Soviets. In the time of this cadre expansion of like thousands and thousands joining the party, <clears throat> that's what those people were armed with to go back into their workplaces, into their factories with the April Theses, all power to the... If you want to end the, the, the war, you have to end capitalism. We should also point out that this whole history of debates, every time there was all these crises and internal faction fights, that, that was a period of clarification that educated. You know, this is the way that uh, democratic centralism functions. This was something that Lenin also uh, really developed and, and insisted on. You have full freedom of discussion to compare all the views. <clears throat> you take a vote, majority rules, and it's full unity in action. Now, in April, there was a ton of confusion in the party. I mean, really, Lenin shocked everybody when he came and gave this position. After all those years of cadre training, it's not like you had... Those 8,000 members were not 8,000 Lenins. <clears throat> but they were cadres, they were, they were trained in Marxism. And democratic centralism allowed them to hear that view in the debate, a battle of ideas, there's like an arena of different ideas. And democratic centralism is designed for Marxism to prevail in that battle. It's like everyone in the room is putting their Marxism together, they're putting their heads together and it's like a collective compass. And when the correct position is put forward, that compass has to respond and say, that's, that, that's it, that's the real position. That is the only way, that's the only organizational form that allows an organization to have like materialist dialectics in the driver's seat. <laughs> and it only works if you have a lot of Marxists. You have to have a core of people that don't just have theoretical abstractions in their heads and memorize phrases. That core has to be made of people that can understand reality as it's unfolding. Who are capable of recognizing the moment when it's time to gather every inch of your strength. When you better get your last drop of courage because it's time to step up to the ultimate test. From beginning to end, the Bolshevik party was the history of creating Marxists. <laughs> Bolshevism isn't exactly separate from Marxism. Ideologically, you know, Marx, Engels, those ideas, that method, that's what Lenin defended. And very few people actually got it in a very deep way. A lot of people filtered through those ranks. A lot of people didn't pass the test. But there, there was a core of cadres that did. They, they, they pushed through to the end. That generation of Bolsheviks that we, we said at the beginning, that tenacity, that, that first ingredient of having something, uh, something inside, that was created by the conditions of czarism. You can thank czarism for creating such a destructive force that brought it down.
But comrades, modern day capitalism in the 2020s is an even more, is creating an even more destructive force. That thing that the Narodniks felt inside, that the Bolsheviks felt, history is producing that again. It doesn't always produce that ingredient. That's a special ingredient. At certain, at certain times it pops up. A generation of people that say, there is nothing more important in my life than to be a participant in the end of capitalism. History is producing that again. You can feel it. You can feel it getting reinforced. <laughs> Point is, that's one component. The other component is depth. The granite foundation of Marxist theory. The ability to think like materialists. The ability to understand how the new reality is emerging from the current reality. We can bring these things together, comrades, with the ideas of this international. And we'll create a new generation of Bolsheviks. So thank you, thank you, Antonio, for the really inspiring lead-off. So, comrades, I think one of the main lessons of this discussion is that the tactics to build the party is a very concrete question that must adapt to concrete conditions. And we can also see how Lenin, while developing the tactics required by every stage, uh, often have to fight against tendency that express the pressure coming from alien classes inside the party. It was a living struggle that often expressed initially on organizational questions. For instance, in one step forward and two steps back, Lenin says, referring to the debate on the, in the second Congress of the Social Democratic Party on the first rule of the, of the party, that Every little difference may assume tremendous importance if it serves as a starting point for a swing towards definite mistaken views. So, for example, going back to the fight against economies, in his fight on how the party should work, Lenin was fighting actually for the very existence of a, of a party. The economists emphasized and their main goal was the economic struggle of the working class, the political struggle was ascribed to the, the capitalist class. And this was an expression of the revisionism of Bernstein in Russian soil. And if all the emphasis was on the economic struggles in individual factories, the tool to do this were small, isolated, volatile circles that had no connection uh, among them, between them. And the National Party was not required. So in writings uh, as uh, what is to be done, Lenin put all the emphasis on the task of overcoming the mentality of small circles, developing a national centralized organization, considering the party as a whole and not as the sum of independent groups. So uh, in that period, the emphasis was on centralism. And there were also polemical exaggerations. In 1907, Lenin pointed out so some years later, that the victory of the idea of a party as an organization of professional revolutionaries would have been impossible if it had not been pushed to the front line, to the forefront at the time, if we had not exaggerated. As Antonio explained, also the debate in 1903 in the Second Congress on the definition of a party members reflected deeper, uh, deeper divisions, deeper, different viewpoints on the task of the, on the, of the party. In one step forward, two steps back, Lenin said, to forget this distinction between the vanguard and the whole of the masses gravitating towards this means to deceive oneself, to shut one's eyes to the immensity of our texts and to narrow down those texts. So we can see how the emphasis put by Lenin was on centralism, on defining the borders of the party, on professional methods. And, and this was required not only for the illegal conditions of work, but also because the party was moving its first steps that, was, that were opening up the road to uh, connect later to wider, uh, broader uh, layers of the masses. 
So we should not surprise that in 1905, in a complete change situation, in a revolutionary situation, Lenin put forward everything he had fought against in the previous period. <laughs> so, for instance, more democratic and less centralized method, like uh, the voting system inside the party, moving up to the unification congress with the, with the Mensheviks, opening up the party to the workers. He said, by hundreds and thousands, incorporate them in the ranks of the party organization, he, he told. So, uh, for instance, he said that the, the conditions, in, in a text in, for, uh, of November 1905, he said, the condition in which the party is function, are functioning are changing radically. We must hasten to organize in a new wave. We must submit new methods. We must boldly and resolutely lay down new line. So you can see that the, the emphasis, the tone, and that it was on, another, uh, on, on, on things that were opposed uh, formally to what he had said in, in the previous period. So taxes is concrete, and sharp and sudden changes in the situation required sudden and sharp changes in the tactics. But we must also point out that this ability we cannot consider it as something granted. I think Antonio explained this point very, very well. Lenin often met resistances inside the party from leading comrades that had adapted to the previous method of work and that had made a fetish of, of the previous organizational form. I think it is, it is interesting uh, how Lenin replied to those objecting that opening up the party in 1905 would dissolve the party among the masses. But what replied Lenin to this objection? He said, this danger could undoubtedly become a very serious one if, if we lacked party principles, that is, program, technical rules, organizational experience entirely. And then he said, we have insisted on the tremendous importance of continuity in the party's development. <laughs> we have preached discipline and demanding that every party member be trained in one or the other of the party organizations. So there lies a very important point here, I think. In the, in the course of the life of a party, there can be different stages, different tactics, different orientations. So what is the fil rouge, or we would say the unbroken thread that can keep the continuity of the party along all these different stages? And I think it is what we are doing here. The political education, the study of the theory, of the history, transmitting the theoretical heritage that gives the party the capacity to digest the experience through the ideas of Marxism. Because this is what gives the same political context of all different kinds of tactics that we can have. And subject these tactics to our strategic goal to become the tool with which the working masses will overthrow the capitalists. Thank you, Serena. Next speaker will be Nacho from Spain, followed by Lucas from Germany. We are studying a, a, a living uh, phenomenon. A success story that is the biggest success story in history. But we have to uh, study not only uh, victories and successes, but also weaknesses. If building a, a, a revolutionary party just involved uh, learning uh, a few formulas and, and waving the, the hammer and the sickle, we'd already have uh, communism. Eso, eso no es más que confundir la forma y el contenido, y eso es lo que hacen centenares de sectas por, eh, por todo el mundo. That would be mixing up uh, uh, form and content, and that's what uh, the sects do all over the world. Tenemos que, a la hora de estudiar, tenemos que entender que los ejemplos que, que observamos, los que leemos, nos tienen que ayudar a reconocer patrones. Es una de las partes fundamentales del estudio, reconocer patrones. Uh, an important uh, task when we are learning theory is that we are able to uh, detect uh, patterns and tendencies. Una de las tendencias que ya ha nombrado Antonio, es tendencia a la resistencia al cambio de los hombres del comité, 
pero que se puede resumir en quizá una peque un pequeño concepto que es inercia de pensamiento. Uh, Antonio already described uh, how uh, the, the, the resistance of the committee men to uh, understand the new situation and we could refer we could refer to this as the, the inertia in, in thought. Al final eh, no es solo el la frase que decía Alan en el libro del bolchevismo, un poco de conocimiento es algo peligroso. Uh, as Alan says in the Bolshevism book, a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous. En el momento en el que crees que dominas algo, ese es el momento más peligroso en el que puedes dejar de prestar atención, tropezar y caer. When you think that you've mastered a particular idea, you can become uh, blind and, and just uh, fall over yourself. Se ha nombrado la forma en la que se eh, enfrentó los soviets en 1905, el boicot de la Duma y we see this inertia in, in thought uh, over the question of the, of the of the change in the party orientation in 1905 the duma in 1907 and the, the debate over the democratic dictator, dictatorship of the peasants and the workers in 1917 también en nuestra antigua organización de Ted Grant. We see this inertia in, in, in thought, uh, in the history of the Stalinist uh, parties, but even in our own history, in, in Ted Grant's uh, old uh, tendency. Hubo, eh, en el análisis que Alan hizo después de la decisión, pulsión, él planteó una cuestión muy concreta. El partido simplemente dejó de pensar. Uh, after the 1992 split, uh, Alan said that the party had stopped thinking. Esto es lo que para nosotros debe de ser fundamental a la hora de enfrentar la construcción del partido, no dejar de pensar, no dejar de hacernos preguntas. And this is something vital for us when we're building the party that we should not stop thinking and not stop uh, uh, asking ourselves questions. No quedarnos con las ideas generales, sino profundizarlas a través de preguntas para obtener las respuestas correctas. Tenemos que hacer las preguntas adecuadas y no dejar de hacer. We should not stay just on the on the level of uh, abstract uh, principles, but keep keep asking yourself, uh, ourselves questions and, and deepening, going deeper into the theory. Trotsky once said that uh, all abstractions can become a, a weapon in the hands of the class enemy. Al final la construcción del partido, esto se nombró ayer, pero es la lucha constante por convertir en cuadros y en, en marxistas a gente que entra y no lo es. Uh, it, it was said yesterday that the building of the party is all about uh, training up uh, cadres and, and turning our new members into marxists. That's the whole point. Y es, y es una lucha permanente porque cada vez va entrando más gente y no podemos asumir que quien ha sido un cuadro siempre, siempre lo será. And this is a non-ending uh, uh, struggle because uh, we get uh, new people coming into our ranks uh, constantly, and we cannot just assume that those who were cadres in the past will, will, will be so for the rest of their lives. Discipline in the Bolshevik party uh, uh, comes from an understanding of theory. Discipline is not the same thing as obedience. Creo que fue a Bukharin que le dijo a Lenin, si quieres, un, si quieres obediencia tendrás un partido de tontos obedientes. Lenin told uh, Bukharin that if you just want obedience, you will just have a party of obedient fools. Y yo he dicho que sería breve, así que si me dejáis, termino con una cita de Carl Sagan, ya se ha tomado la Biblia bastante. Uh, and I'll just uh, finish with a quote from Carl Sagan. Él dice, la ciencia... No, termino ya. La, la ciencia, nosotros diríamos el marxismo... He said, uh, science, and we, here we'd say marxism... No es solo un cuerpo de conocimientos, es una forma de pensar. Isn't just uh, a body of uh, knowledge, it's also a way of thinking. Es una forma de interrogar al universo. It's a way of, uh, of um, uh, analyzing, assessing the, the universe. Con un fino entendimiento de la falibilidad humana. With a very clear understanding of, of the shortcomings of, of humans. Y yo creo que con esto ya puedo. And that's enough. So thanks, comrade, for the very sharp intervention. Uh, saving time helps others to get in. Uh, so the next speaker will be Lucas from Germany, followed by Evandro from Brazil. Lucas, where are you? I guess Evandro will be first, <laughs> and followed by Lucas, I hope. I, I will start off with a quote from Trotsky from his uh, Stalin book. And uh, it's about how the Bolsheviks uh, uh, um, looked at the youth. Uh, the liquidators used to say that uh, Lenin was surrounded by young kids. 
But what the liquidator saw as a disadvantage, Lenin saw as a great uh, asset, because revolutions like war uh, are decided by the youth. A socialist party that can not win over the youth has no future. Uh, Trotsky also devoted quite some attention to the youth, he explains in the transitional program. That only the, the open-mindedness and the, and the determination of the youth can guarantee the, the, the first uh, victories. And that the enthusiasm of the youth can also win over uh, the older and, and, and more, more tired layers of the working class. Uh, these are so, just a few examples that prove that uh, over history, revolutionaries and especially the Bolsheviks not only tried to understand the youth, but they tried to win it over uh, for the revolutionary struggle of the working class. From the Iskra days, uh, Lenin emphasized the need of, uh, of winning over the youth and of, uh, and of winning over the students. Winning over uh, the youth to the ranks of the, of the organization is a cr critical task for revolutionaries. Uh, and that can only be done if they understand the importance of this uh, uh, social layer that does not belong to the working class, but that will, uh, that will assist the, the revolution. Uh, this is an important legacy of the, of the Bolshevik party. When we look at its uh, origins, at the origins of the, of the Russian uh, working class movement and at the education of its uh, early cadres, we can understand how they, how they drew that conclusion. In the second half of the 19th century, uh, Russia had not yet developed capitalism, but its economy started to become interlinked with uh, world capitalism. In that context, uh, a layer of the youth was awakened to the, to the struggle uh, on the basis of the wrong ideas of the Narodniks and, the, and down the path of, of individual terror. But later on, on the basis of uh, Marxist organizations. In 1893, Lenin began uh, in earnest his, uh, his political career at the age of uh, 23. In uh, 1898, the, the Russian uh, Social Democratic Party was set up. And in 1901, a wave of strikes began in Rostov-on-Don that, uh, that mobilized uh, both workers and, and, and young people. And it was in that context of a great uh, upswing in, in, in demonstrations and, and strikes that the first Bolshevik cadres were won over and, and steeled. Just, I'll just give a few examples. Sverdlov in 1901 was already uh, a, a, a committed uh, Marxist at the age of 16. Sinoviev joined the party in 1902 at the age of 18. Uh, and that very same year, Kamyanev was uh, arrested for the first time. He went into exile and became a professional revolutionary at the age of 19. Bukharin began his uh, political life at the age of, uh, of uh, six, 17 uh, and Trotsky at the age of 17. Yeah. Bukharin 16, Trotsky 17. All these revolutionaries were drawn close to the Social Democratic Party and were, were and the, the, they were they were influenced by the social struggles of the of the of that epoch. Uh, the, they were under they were they, they, they were operating under very difficult conditions, uh, persecuted by the by the police, uh, frequently arrested. The different waves of young people that joined the, the party uh, uh, coincided with, uh, with the waves of, of uh, social struggle. Uh, 
y los años siguientes y finalmente la generación de 1911 y 1912. There were different generations. The earliest one, the one from uh, 1898, the generation of uh, Lenin, Trotsky, uh, Sinoviev, Kamenev, Bukharin. Uh, but then we have the generation of 1905 uh, and finally that of 1917. Los años de experiencia luchando a una edad temprana y luego buscando construir organizaciones juveniles fueron fundamentales para que los bolcheviques comprendieran el papel de la juventud en la lucha revolucionaria. And this living experience of trying to uh, build the, the organization under very turbulent uh, conditions were vital uh, to shape the Bolshevik understanding of the role of the youth. Asimismo, con el triunfo de, re de la revolución en 1917, comenzaron a discutir y reflexionar sobre las tareas de las nuevas generaciones en, las con en la construcción de una nueva sociedad. After 1917, the Bolsheviks began to debate the role of the new generations in the building of a new society. La mayor expresión de este pensamiento se puede encontrar en el discurso de Lenin de 1920 en el tercer congreso con el ruso de la Unión de la Juventud Comunista. Uh, the, 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 and the, the, this, this uh, ideas can be summed up in uh, Lenin's uh, speech to the Komsomol in 1920. En él, Lenin explica que la mayor tarea de un joven es aprender. Un joven, según Lenin, debe aprender el comunismo para luego construir una sociedad comunista. Uh, the main task of the youth, Lenin says, is to learn. The, the youth must learn communism in order to build a communist society. Entonces, ¿cómo podemos aprender a ser comunistas? Adquirir conocimiento de todo lo que ha acumulado la humanidad, incluir la burguesía. He says, how, how do we learn communism? We have to learn the entire heritage of, uh, of uh, humanity, including the knowledge that was um, accrued under the bourgeoisie. Esta es una cuestión crucial para los jóvenes, ya que se trata de aprender a absorber críticamente lo que la humanidad ha producido hasta ahora y saber utilizar todo lo necesario para construir una nueva sociedad. Uh, this is a critical task for the youth. It must, it must uh, catch up with, uh, with uh, the knowledge of, uh, of humanity as a, as a whole and get the necessary materials to build a new society. No sabemos cómo será una sociedad comunista, pero sabemos que la ciencia producida por la sociedad burguesa no será descartada. We don't know how uh, communism will exactly uh, look like, but we, we certainly know that, uh, that uh, science, even as developed by the, by the bourgeoisie, will not be uh, uh, discarded. Solo que eh, lo utilizamos de manera que no satisfaga las necesidades del mercado ni de la guerra, sino de la sociedad y que lo desa desarrollaremos aún más, permitiendo el descubrimiento de curas para enfermedades nuevas tecnologías que permitan viajar más rápido y a lugares más... But uh, science will not be put at the service of, uh, of uh, greed and of, and of war, but will rather be uh, used to, uh, for, the, for the benefit of humanity as a whole, to find new cures for, for diseases and to, and to develop new technologies. Pero Lenin, Marx, Engels, Trotsky y muchos otros no aprendieron solo de los libros. Como se demostró anteriormente, los cuadros bolcheviques surgieron de la lucha práctica, de los enfrentamientos en las escuelas, en las fábricas y en la lucha de la clase de clases cotidiana. Uh, but as is the case uh, with all the revolutionaries, Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky did not learn only from books, uh, but from the living uh, struggle as well in the in the schools, in the in the factories, in the strikes. Solo es posible convertirse en comunista cuando el estudio profundo del mundo en que vivimos está conectado con la lucha de los trabajadores contra la sociedad capitalista. One can only become uh, a real uh, communist when one is able to link uh, the theory and the, and the books with the living uh, struggle against, uh, of the working class against capitalist society. Esta fue, como dicen los marxistas, la escuela del bolchevismo. As uh, Marxists said, this was the school of, uh, of uh, bolchevism. La única clase verdaderamente revolucionaria en la sociedad burguesa es la clase trabajadora. The only revolutionary class in bourgeois society is the working class. Las contradicciones del régimen burgués transformaron la capa más explotada de la sociedad en la única capaz de destruir el propio régimen. The contradictions created by the bourgeois regime turned the most exploited class uh, under this society into the only force that can destroy the current system. Uh, bombilla se asciende, ninguna rueda gira sin las manos de la clase trabajadora. Not a, not a bulb shines, not a wheel turns without the kind permission of the working class. Y será en su juventud 
donde esta clase encontrará un fuerte punto de apoyo lleno de vivacidad, coraje y voluntad de lucha. And it will, it will be amongst uh, the youth of this class that, it, that uh, the revolution will find its, uh, its strongest and most enthusiastic point of support. Thank you, comrade. The next speaker is Lucas from Germany, followed by Isaias from Sweden. Hello, comrades. All over the world, we are confronted with questions like these. Why are you founding this international? Do we really need another communist organization? There are so many other groups. What makes us stand out? Often, people then suggest that all of the different groups on the left should overcome their differences and unite. That's their understanding on, uh, on how one should um, build a, working, a Marx party and gain influence among the working class. The question of unity was also a central debate in the early days of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. When it was founded in, in 1898, the party consisted of many small groups scattered all over Russia. These groups stood for very different programs and methods. They were isolated from one another and were mainly concerned with the local struggles around them. The question was how to build a real party from this situation, with a common understanding and a common work. How did Lenin tackle this task? He wrote in 1900, before we can unite, and in order that we may unite, we must first of all draw firm and definite lines of demarcation. Since among the different groups affiliating to the party, there were, there were reformers that gave up the political fight against Tsarism and capitalism. By sticking to purely economic um, demands like wages and working hours, they sought a shortcut to the masses. Programmatic concessions like this is what we call opportunism. They justified their position called economism by explaining that the Russian working class wasn't interested in politics. By doing so, these reformists left the political arena completely to the liberals. And the liberals, as capitalists, of course, had no interest in the emancipation of the workers. The economists, with their program and methods, would have doomed the young Russian party to failure. As Lenin explained, the economists recognized only that part of the class struggle that was acceptable to the liberals, the liberal bourgeoisie. The, re the economists refused to go farther than the liberals. They refused to recognize the higher form of class struggle, the class struggle which is unacceptable to the liberals. Lenin said that the economists abandoned the Marxist revolutionary conception of the class struggle and became liberal workers' politicians. Today, reformism stands as the most important pillar of capitalism. As we know, most states recognize the right to strike as a way to release some built-up tension in society. So class struggle has to embrace a higher sphere, the sphere of politics also. And as Lenin said, in the sphere of politics, it has to go deeper than minor matters. Marxism recognizes class struggle as fully developed when it takes in the most important part of politics, the organization of state power. At the same time, Lenin didn't separate the, econo the economic from the political struggle to overthrow capitalism. By particip participating in local spontaneous fights, the party should win over the most advanced layers of the working class. That's what Lenin suggested in the early days of uh, Russian social democracy. He wanted to raise the level of consciousness and not tell the workers what they already knew. Lenin sought to unify the local struggles to a nationwide fight against Tsarism and capitalism. And his plan to achieve this was a nation, uh, an old Russian, a nationwide newspaper. He wrote, an economic struggle that is not united by a central organ cannot become the class struggle of the entire Russian proletariat. A newspaper is a transmission belt for a party, as it allows constant agitation and propaganda. It allows us to make political comments on, on the different struggles and raise the level of consciousness. It also serves as a platform for the best methods for the struggles. In 1900, Lenin launched such a newspaper. It was called Iskra, and this Iskra stood for a revolutionary communist program. The tendency around the paper managed to become the dominant force in the, Russia, in the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party by its second congress in 1903. Lenin disproved the main argument of the economists in practice. He uh, won over the most advanced layers of the Russian working class to a revolutionary communist program. The tendency around Iskra was the base on which the Bolshevik party was later built. So what can we learn from this all today? for today? Around the world, the youth and the most advanced layers of the working class are looking for revolutionary ideas, our ideas. If we water down our program, we won't reach those layers. The same is true when we join sides with those who will betray the movement, like the reformers or the petty bourgeois activists who want to limit the struggle, like we can see right now globally with the uh, university occupations. Of course, we will join our class in battle, no matter their leadership. 
but we do so with our own program. The program of revolutionary communism. This way we will reach the most advanced layers now and train them to become professional revolutionaries. We build this international as the leadership for the coming world revolution. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, Lukas. The next one uh, is Yesayas from Sweden, followed by Tom from the US. In Iran, in the past, oh, for, uh, since the end of the uprising in 2022, a serious discussion has begun about a cater organization. This is after the failure of the 2022 uprising, when the revolutionary youth committees have asked themselves, what should we do now? And a minority of these revolutionary youth committees call themselves communists. And I would like to read a statement they published uh, less than a year ago, where they, um, where they explain the following. A communist cater in revolutionary conditions, in conditions that pose the question of power, can organize thousands. And because of this, the most important task for us currently is to stimulate the formation of secret cells and to try to develop revolutionary caters. This, in our opinion, is the most important task. And what is to be done is being widely cir circulated in Iran. And the revolutionary youth reading what is to be done must see an enormous parallel with Tsarist Russia at that time and Iran today. Iran has gone through a period of intensive class struggle for six years with stri constant strikes, yearly uprisings, and constant protests. The m major difference being that in Iran, there uh, isn't a conscious Marxist movement, just a vague memory of the old Stalinist communist movement. Sorry. But, but despite these revolutionary youths calling for a uh, cater organization, they are not Bolsheviks. They truly have the heroism of Bolsheviks, who even now, in a, situ in a horribly reactionary situation, after a horrible crackdown since the uprising, where 400 have been executed, tens of thousands have been arrested, they continue their political work but they lack completely the political understanding and the political theory. They're completely ultra-left. They confuse themselves for the masses and their own consciousness for the masses constantly. In the past six years, there have been various workers' organizations which put forward different programs of minimum demands. And they completely reject them and say the only program they have is the socialization of production and down with the Islamic Republic. But there is something positive in this, that they are consciously do not want to create any illusions in liberalism or in bourgeois democracy. But what is precisely is needed is a transitional program linking the minimum demands of the masses to the struggle for socialism, precisely what Lenin did. And the other a bit insane example is the question of Soviets during the uprising in 2022. There were Soviets in the Iranian Revolution 1979, and there's a memory of this. But during the uprising, these communists started calling their revolutionary cells for Soviets. It would be like if our American comrades during the BLM movement started renaming their branches the Soviet of New York, the Soviet of Boston, and so forth. And these questions could be quite easily answered by studying the history of Bolshevism. There's an enormous parallel between Tsarist Russia and Iran. Both are dictatorships, underdeveloped countries. The, que the question how to relate to democratic de demands and, the, and liberals and reformists would be easily, easily answered. That the necessity of having clear class independence, but supporting all democratic reforms and demands. But unfortunately, these ideas have been buried in Iran. Firstly, at the, we are, the communist movement in Iran was a, com, was a Stalinist movement. The original communist party created in the Comintern was executed during the purges. And after that, the Soviet Union, the Stalinists created a purely pure Stalinist party with no connections to Bolshevism. Purely a character, they would talk about that they have a cater organization. But honestly, when a few comrades recently read about this party's history, they, they said it sounded more like a European social democratic party than a communist party. Uh, among other things, the horribly low political level. Uh, a good 
measure of this is the lack of material which was translated into Persian uh, uh, in this mass party, the Tudeh party. And you cannot have a, a revolutionary cater organization without theory, because that is the foundation of that organization to function. And at the same time, to these ultra-lefts who mainly understand uh, the question of a cater organization from purely security concerns, they, f they fail to understand that the question of a cater organization lies in how the class struggle develops from a revolutionary minority, which can be won over in a revolution. Uh, and this is also how we, very, as an international, stand out. Because precisely as one of the Brazilian comrades uh, said, uh, quoting Lenin to Bakunin, the Stalinist party created obedient fools. Um, and, and I will take Iran as an example. This party, the Tudeh party, led the working class uh, in slaughter after slaughter uh, for the same mistake, the question of the People's Front. And this is precisely the role of our international, is to be a beacon of the genuine ideas of Bolshevism. Uh, which are especially relevant to countries like Iran in the tough dictatorships, but also universal in its conclusions. I feel like I'm repeating what every comrade says, but the importance of revolutionary theory, from the abstract, but to the concrete, to understand the actual living movement of the working class. On this basis, we will be able to build not only an organization like the Bolsheviks, but I hope better than the Bolsheviks in many ways. And give countries like Iran, who have been robbed by Stalinism, the leadership they have deserved, the proper leadership to overthrow capitalism. Thank you, comrades. Thank you. Thank you, comrades. The last speaker, the last speaker for this session is Tom from the US, followed by Comrades, if you look at the history of the socialist and communist movement, country after country, over the decades, you see over time the leadership, uh, a leadership trend towards opportunism and in some cases the disintegration of the, uh, the parties and the organizations. And we have to understand why, which is of course partially a result of the power of the ruling class, the power of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie, particularly in its control of media and education, is able to ha be a powerful factor in shaping so-called public opinion. And this public opinion tends to weigh on, on the uh, leadership of the communists and socialist parties and even on the cadre. Now, if the communists, when, when we take over uh, state power around the world, we can, we can uh, take the media and the education system away from the bourgeoisie, we won't have to worry about them affecting or shaping public opinion. But the key question is how do we go from where we are today to that point? And Lenin and the Bolsheviks show that it's only through the, the building of a Marxist cadre organization that we can achieve that kind of goal. Now, Trotsky said that the Bolshevik party, in, in, was, at least at, at the time that he wrote, was the greatest party that's ever been built, the ever, greatest Marxist party that's ever been built. Yes, and even that party did degenerate. But when the Bolsheviks degenerated, it was because they were isolated for a prolonged period of time in a backward country. In effect, the responsibility for the degeneration of the Bolshevik party was not really with the Bolsheviks. That responsibility was on the shoulders of the revolutionaries outside of Russia who failed to build the Marxist cadre organization. We all know if Marxist cadre organizations had been built in Germany, in, in, in France, in, in Italy, in other countries prior to 1917, um, when that revolutionary wave hit, the results could have been very different. So our task is to build a thinking Marxist cadre who can use the Marxist method to analyze the situation and to guide our political intervention so that we can intervene in the masses but not adapt to bourgeois public opinion. 
Now, there, th this takes patience and time to build such an organization. Sectarians and reformists are always looking for shortcuts. Some of them will, will quote Lenin and say, politics really begins when you're intervening among millions of people. Yes, we want to intervene in millions of people, but we need forces that are able to do it and able to resist that, that pressure from the bourgeois. Comrades, I think the key is that we must get the most from what we have in terms of what we have in our organizations. Take that and, we, and, and try not to overextend our forces, but if we overextend, we, can't, we can overextend for a period, but not for too long. Otherwise, we will succumb to those pressures like the, like the other uh, uh, leaders in the past. I, I just want to end on this. The, you know, it, it's so important that the Revolutionary Communist International has a workshop on how the Bolshevik party was built. We are the only political force on the planet that takes this seriously. We don't have a workshop on this subject to criticize it. We have a workshop on this subject to learn from it. And that's why we're going to succeed. Thanks, Tom. Thanks to all the comrades uh, that were able to speak and apologies to uh, Elias uh, from Sweden and Chuck from Italy who couldn't come off the list. I think we had a great discussion and I think the even greater part will be the sum up by uh, Comrade Antonio now. Comrades, uh, if you want to sum up uh, one of Lenin's strengths, he had a, a strength of perception. Part of thinking dialectically is um, it's, it's not just looking at the past and analyzing the past. It's always easier in hindsight to look back and say, oh, there was a process that was unfolding. Now I see what was happening. The trick is to perceive that process as it's unfolding around you when it's not easy to see. To see the limits of the current situation and how they're going to shape the next situation. You can start to anticipate where, where things are going. <clears throat> you can't write an article and teach someone to think that way. It just by, you can't just pick that up out of a book. It's a habit of thought. But if you study hundreds of articles and if you study the whole history, there you can start to assimilate that habit of thought. Lenin was always concerned with analyzing the stage that the movement was passing through. Like everything else in history, you have a, a certain stage, there are, limits, there are limits to the current phase. And you can see a new phase coming on the horizon, you can prepare for it. But the thing is that when you take a step forward, when the movement goes from one stage to the next stage, that inevitably it brings new contradictions, it brings new problems that you didn't see before. And then the critical thing is, do you perceive the new situation? Do you see the new problems? Now obviously the movement, it's not that Bolshevism develops always through the same stages, just like society doesn't always move through exactly the same stages. But I think it always has the same initial stage. If this whole thing, if building a Bolshevik force of cadres depends on creating Marxists, of training a core of people who can think in this special way and see the world through this special lens, then that process can't, cannot get started. It can't get up on its feet until you have Marxism, until you have it sinking roots. Lenin explains that Russia achieved Marxism in a dramatic way because, it, because of the agony that it had gone through over, over decades of trying to overthrow the Tsar with the wrong ideas, the agony of Narodnism. And when Plekhanov uh, allowed Marxism to, he planted the seed when he, when he brought that idea into Russia. It's not just that his books were so well written that everyone got it, it's, it's not that. There was a number of factors, but I would say that one of the important was they brought Marxism, Marxism into Russia by the roots of Marxism. Plekhanov was explaining Marxist philosophy. It's not just like a high level, like here are the main, here are the main ideas of Marxism. He was explaining, this is how Marxism emerged. This, this materialist view, it's so powerful, it's the result of the entire enlightenment. You see, 300 years of human thought produced this kind of materialism. And the ability to think dialectically and, and apply materialism consistently was thanks to a contribution that Hegel made. And in turn, Hegel came to his conclusions of systematizing dialectics because he studied all the philosophy and analyzed the process as it was unfolding from one stage to the next. You think it... Uh, in, uh, in nature or in, even in architecture, if you want something solid that's going to endure, something that's going to last, it's all about the foundations. How well rooted is it? And I love this analogy of roots themselves. The, the rooting process, you know, you plant a seed, the way it begins, 
The first embryonic seed, the, the, the first part of the, uh, the seedling that comes out is always a special root. It's the first root. It always goes straight down. It has one task, to achieve depth. In English, there's a, the, we call this the tap root. You know, there's a special, this is the special root, tap root. It grows, and if you look at a diagram of a plant, there's always one big root that's going straight down, and then laterally, there's other roots that come out. The strength of that root, the strength of the depth, the anchor, is going to determine how solid that plant is. And if it gets severed, if the taproot dies, the plant dies. The ability of hundreds and then thousands of people to become materialists, to really understand Marxism in a deep way in Russia, laid the basis for everything else that came. It could, you couldn't have had any of this history if you didn't have that root first. And it's easy to look back and say, like, in high, all of the history that the Bolsheviks went through, the, the battles on the barricades and the, the Tsarist repression and the Duma, it could seem like the study groups was, like, the easy part. I think the truth is, at, at every stage, from beginning to end, there was always a very, there was always a pressing battle. There was always a particular obstacle, the main obstacle. And at the early stage, attempt, uh, achieving that depth was the obstacle. Becoming Marxist, was, that was the first obstacle, and it, it took a lot of effort. Think, of, think about being a, a factory worker in the 1890s and you're, you have a 12-hour day and of course you're physically exhausted, you're mentally exhausted and late at night you're going to go to a reading group. There's actually a, an eyewitness account in the Bolshevism book that, that describes someone that participated in, in one of these. It was a, a, young, a reading group of young women, young factory uh, work, workers in, in a factory. They describe them as soap workers, sugar workers, pale, thin, red-eyed. They gather late in the evening and they would sit up until one in the morning in a stuffy room with a little gas lamp burning. And they'd be learning about philosophy and history and sitting there with, they, they were entranced, listening to the talks, asking questions, reading these forbidden books and, and forgetting that they were about to have to trudge through the snow in the middle of the night to get back home and go to the factory again the next day. If Bolshevism is the determination to smash all obstacles, in that stage, that was the obstacle to be smashed. When the movement was ready to take another step forward, and they noticed it because they saw what was happening in society. In the 1890s, the big strike wave, there's ferment, and they realized it's time to go from like the study circles, we need to turn outward, agitation, connect with the workers. It was a widespread phenomenon. This whole, it was a general shift. Everyone realized it. There must have been a, a big energy, a big excitement about now it's the time for agitation. <coughs> That was a new phase of the movement, but it brought new challenges, new contradictions, new problems. In fact, this problem of economism, of watering down, of leaving the politics aside, is a, is a result of that turn. They go into the fact they're trying to connect with the workers, and if it's hard to make it in a deep way, then they try to make it in a connection in a superficial way. When Marxism like, reached a full bloom in Russia, and you had like, this period where everyone became a Marxist, that everyone included the intelligentsia and a big section of the liberal bourgeoisie. Because they were saying, oh, Marxism is, saying, is arguing that the logic of history, czar uh, feudalism is going to be overthrown, and then the bourgeoisie comes to power. That, that's us. <laughs> they found a justification for their own aspirations in Marxism, so they started giving money to them, to the Marxists. And all of these circles, they're blooming, they're getting all of this, you know, the, the, the book publishers are publishing all this Marxism. That was good, but it, brought, it had a cost, it had a contradiction. That was a period of legal Marxism. And those distortions were the main problem for years in the whole movement. The whole battle with Menshevism came out of people that were trained by a distorted version of Marxism. So again, the, the whole thing is you realize every step forward you take is going to bring a new contradiction that you have to perceive. And being a materialist and being a dialectician means you have the, the two tools, the two instruments that you need to perceive those changes as they're happening. That's the only way that a party of revolutionaries can defy the immense pressures that they come under. You have to realize that becoming a Marxist means you're taking a stance that puts you against the current of the dominant flow of ideology in society. And only if you're really grounded, if your stance is really firm, can you have any chance of withstanding that current. If you lack the depth, you're going to get swept with it, and you're not even going to realize it. That's what's happened to the rest of the left. But it's not just the, the creation of... It's, it's the, the subjective factor has to connect with something outside of it. You need to have this Marxist force, this Bolshevik force, but it needs to emerge at a time when there's something happening in the class struggle, something that we don't control. It's... 
two different processes. They develop independently until they're ready to intersect. And we're living in a time when we can see this intersect, comrades. It's possible. A couple weeks ago, the New York Times uh, conducted an opinion poll on registered voters in the U.S. This is a special election, you know, a rematch. And they found that 14% of registered voters, they want to see the entire economic and political system torn down. I did the math. That's 24 million people. Probably a lot of the same people who were in the streets four years ago. There's another 89 million voters who want to see fundamental changes to the political and economic system. On top of that, there's another 80 million people who don't bother registering to vote. They don't see the point. So if you put together the, those 80 million non-registered and the 89 who want fundamental change, that's 169 million people. And there's a minority of 24 million who already want to tear it down. How do you organize those 24 million to convince the other 169 million patiently that the change that they're looking for is the end of capitalism? What will it take, what will it take to organize them to actually do the job, actually carry out the thing they want to do? That's the question we've been discussing, comrades. That's the task of Bolshevism.